I'm Cray Beaumont Flynn. Welcome to Beyond the Design, a show that gives you a peek behind the curtain of the design industry and shares the stories of those that are the driving force behind it. Welcome to Beyond the Design. Today we have Kyle Bunting. Welcome to the show, Kyle. Hey, thanks for having me. Proud of you. Well, won't we just why don't we just start off right at the top and tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got started in uh, design. That's an open-ended question. How much time do we have? <laughs> as long as you want, sir. You know, I don't know. I think, uh, I'm not so sure I'd like to uh, describe it as being in design as, as much as I'd probably say I just was always in um, the creative fields and design was the one uh, I found myself falling into, uh, kind of serendipitously, truth be told. All right, all right. So what what made you get started in, in designing and creating rugs? Well, you know, it was it, it was more of about a, an experience I had prior, I, I think. Um, some people know my history uh, fairly well, his relationship to my father and some things the family did. But I, um, uh, I was in television before I was in the design business. Uh, myself and, and two other partners, I, I was a significant minority partner, make, make no mistake <laughs> about it, we're, um, uh, we're in the TV business and at its pinnacle, it had, you know, a, a pretty good run. Uh, we had about 30 people working in the organization and, and for, for Kyle, he found out that uh, leading and managing uh, creative professionals and kind of moving um uh, product towards, you know, the interest of clients and sponsors was a real natural place for me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this was in the mid nineties. And uh, okay, we, we sold the company in 98 and uh, I spent about a year handing it over. And then wasn't really sure what I was going to do next. Uh, <laughs> it, it was uh, kind of a, a real, um, uh, it was a wonderful experience for me because I was in San Francisco at the time. The kind of the whole dot com thing was going crazy, and everywhere you looked, there was just a kind of a golden age of entrepreneurialism. And um, mm -hmm. you know, we sold the business, and um, I decided to take a little time off. And um, the way I got into design was I hired a designer. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I like to tell our clients I had enough money in my pocket to hire some of y'all, right. not all of y'all. And right. uh, to kind of give a young designer uh, maybe their chance at breaking through, so to speak. I was the client, and um, but I just I went through the process, um, mm -hmm. and I did a, a residential renovation and a, and and designed the space and worked with someone, and I um, I, I just kind of got the buck. Uh, I I started thinking I, I, I that I might want to be in that segment of the creative business, and that uh, if an opportunity in design uh, availed itself to me, um, I'd be excited about taking it on. Uh, mm -hmm. I had no idea I was going to be making high rugs for the rest of my life, uh, <laughs> but I did I did have a sense of thinking that this was a you know a part of the the creative economy that that I wanted to be in. So what motivated you and inspired you to get into the rug field? I mean, is was there a light bulb that kind of sparked saying, okay, well, there's no other competitors in this market? Uh, someone said, oh, you should put cow hides on the floor. I mean, what really sparked you to get that started? Well, I, you know, you're asking the wrong guy. I, 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 <laughs> I'm the product of a public education. Uh, you really... Um, you give me way too much credit. I wish that there was a story about a, an assessment of opportunity in the market and a, and a need for hide that the world had never seen before. But um, I, I think a lot of people in this business and, and I think people that are in the creative field can relate to, it was uh, a, really a, 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 the most serendipitous uh, opportunity and event. If I needed to blame anyone, I'd blame my father and I'd blame Christopher Farr uh, because the synergy between the two of them, although they couldn't be two more completely different people, um, is kind of where uh, everything started. Um, mm. 
what happened with me is 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 this. I was um, you know I was raised in the suburbs outside of Dallas, and you know I was the uh, you know the second son of a serial entrepreneur. Uh, mm-hmm. My brother and I's father had you know tried a little bit of this and a little bit of that and kind of bounced around. Um, different parts of the state and different parts of the U.S., trying to really find his way. And uh, one of the things he had fallen into was he, uh, he worked for a company in Dallas that was in the uh, sporting goods equipment uh, business. And uh, the owners of the company were actually kind of big game hunters. And so they would, you know, go on these crazy trips and they would bring all these pelts and hides in. And my father ran the facility there and they said could you you know could you have these people cut some of these hides up and you know maybe make a carpet or do something with it and uh and he made something but it fell apart real quick because it was all springbok and like antelope and these really right. you know kind of deer skins and so he started poking around looking for something else and he stumbled into cowhide and he started buying hides and messing around with them and, and, and my father was a unique you know, mosaic artist at his creative height. But he was uh, he was working with Hyde and he was making like tabletops and maps and interesting vertical applications. Things mm-hmm. would predominantly go on the walls. Uh, but he had a client one day come in and say, hey, do you think you could make a rug out of what you do? So, so here's me, 10 years old, 1978, Yes, I'm 54, uh, but I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm just a little boy watching my dad cut up pieces of leather in the garage and glue them together. And he made a couple of carpets for some uh, oil guy in Dallas or someplace. And I, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I kind of always remembered it. it. It struck me as, as, as just something really beautiful. It was a stunningly attractive product. And uh, lo and behold, you fast forward to, uh, 1999 or 2000 somewhere in there and i was working with a designer and i was going through the design process and i uh i designed a custom carpet that i bought from christopher farr you know i I got the palms out i pulled the yarns we selected a pattern we kind of waited for the strike off to come from nepal and then ordered the rug and you know three months later it came in you know the, the whole process Right. And I just was kind of fascinated by it, uh, to be honest with you. And I and I, and then I got the carpet and I still have it today and I lived with it and I loved it. But mm-hmm. um, I think about a year later, um, I literally, it was middle of August in 2001, I, I kind of woke up in the middle of the night and I had an art piece my dad had made in my bedroom and I had the carpet on the floor bedside and I got out of bed, you know, and I stepped on it and then I kind of looked up and all of a sudden I was like, wait a second, how cool would it be? Oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, no, oh, no. And everything, it just, it it tumbled into an idea in like, um, like a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I'm really good at is like great ideas, packaging it and going, it looks like this, it works like this, it feels like this, it can be this. I'm good at that, but to see like if we did custom carpets for designers, like I just did from far, but we used hide like my dad did, man, this could be something super cool. And so I woke up, I started drawing, I called him and said, I'm coming tomorrow to see you. You got to show me how to make hide rugs. He's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I got a great <laughs> idea. And uh, the rest is history. And uh, like we tell people all the time in presentations, uh, it's been 22 years and we've made over a million square feet of this stuff. Wow. And uh, I, I I thought it would become something that looks a little bit like what we do at that moment. Uh, but I, I don't know that I thought we would be doing it this long and that it would have become, um, it, it would have become as established as it became as like an option for designers. Not right. just some kind of unique, eccentric, boutique opportunity uh to, instead of became a little bit of a standard and um, i'm real proud of it so when you had this epiphany i'm going to call it 
how long and what challenges have occurred during the 20 plus years being in business? Um, I, you know, again, I go back to the, my opening statement. How much time do you have? I mean, <laughs> developing businesses are unique, but they're not different in, in, in mm-hmm. really any demonstrable way from the same core challenges that any company has from, you know, financial support to timelines to customer service. Those things are, are pretty standard. What I think was, um, what, I, what I think I never, um, I, I never saw or understood about design that I think um, was different in television was the, the level of relationship and the value of relationship in design. Um, design's a relationship business. And, and, and mm-hmm. what that means is, is like, while we have salespeople and while we create a great product and we market it, the designers are our channel. It's our responsibility to support the designers in their vision as artists to give them what they need to fulfill their projects. If they're gracious enough to see how our work can be accreted to their artistic vision, at the very least, we owe them everything we can to help them fulfill that vision. And so I think to answer your question, the the challenges were really to to bring a new concept to the design you know the interior space mm-hmm. and to explain it and have people get their head around it so they could go oh now how's that made and, and what is right. it and where can i use it and 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 what are the limitations and what are the opportunities was i think um uh, it, it became more, you know, evangelism for us. Our challenge was to accept that we didn't care if people bought it or not. We just cared that they got it and they found right. a way to use it somewhere <laughs> down the line. Because if everybody just understood it and said, hey, it may not be my thing, but I get it. Pretty cool. Congratulations. You got a cool new thing. Right. We knew that the rest of the business would take care of itself because the material is the star of the show. And it, and it really is in its... Um, in its highest form, it's a completely unique look and it's really beautiful. And we just uh, happen to have uh, gotten very good at it and benefited from that. So on this journey, was there anything that surprised you on the response that you got from the design community when you first started out? Well, it, it's kind of a funny way to look at it. it the thing that surprised me um, about designers was... Um, their acceptance of the way we wanted to work with what I want to call a, um, maybe a happy breath of fresh air perspective. I don't know if I'm saying this right, but one of the things we, I think we brought into the space was um, when our brand was emerging, it was in the early uh, 2000s. And I, I remember seeing it, you know, uh, advertising and catalogs from, you know, companies like Design Within Reach, right? It's mm-hmm. a perfect example. And, and and you still see this in this business now. And there would be like um, these black and white photos of like some designer in some, you know, great moment of deep contemplative, like genius thought. <laughs> You know, like that they were in the moment of deciding what was so cool that you had to have. That right. We were supposed to be awed by the great chair that was coming from the mind of this person, right? And, and some of that's true and very legit, don't get me wrong, but I, I kind of think the business took itself a little too seriously. And um, I had just emerged from a period of like kind of television and a lot of that television was from the technology sector. And, and open source software was super hot at that time. And people were contributing and collaborating and just trying to create alternatives by just working on things. And a lot of times just doing it for free. And so early in the day, I, I you know, while we collaborate with people to create things and we have our own designs, every time we walked in the door, we were like, hey, I got some cool stuff. Here's a handful of patterns, but Here's what we can do. What are your ideas? Because we fundamentally believe 
We told everybody that ever came in, whether they sold or designed, that the the um, kind of the force of all those creative efforts from the people we get to work with is infinitely greater creatively than we will ever be on our own. So if we embrace that and just take a roll up our sleeves, kind of gee golly, like, wow, that's a great idea. Let's go make that. I think the library of work will expand more rapidly and will be a more approachable um, brand. And I think, mm -hmm. so the answer is that designers went, really? You know, you like my idea? I'm like, hell yeah, you got the great idea. Let's go make <laughs> that thing. I think it really allowed us to have um, a super broad portfolio of creative things and it challenged us also from an engineering perspective to figure out how to make things that people had never made before. And, uh, and I think it really had we thought only the things we think we can make and only mm -hmm. the stuff that is, you know, fundamental to this vision we have or where our engineering prowess was at the time or our color selection. If we had stayed within those narrow lanes, I don't think the business would be anywhere near as interesting or dynamic as it is now. How many uh, designs did you start with when you first launched? Five. Wow. And where are you at now? <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> How many think, fingers do I have? <laughs> yeah, it's a good, it, yeah, I think that it, it is, um, as far as like named and branded and marketable patterns, the library probably has about a hundred designs that we market on a regular basis. The but the the number of designs last time I checked was we had done somewhere over ten thousand different unique things. Wow, wow! And and it's kind of it's kind of unique. I think um, not to like um, suggest we're starting to write like the book on like the history of hide carpets and wall covers. But, but I think for, for our business, you have to organize this in some way where people can wrap their head around it. There's too much info. And, and so we kind of have like, like classics or studio designs that are things that are kind of in-house. Mm -hmm. And we have like collaborations, which are things we do where we partner with other designers to kind of bring a third party perspective in. And then we have like a custom portfolio, which is kind of like, you know, anything goes. Right. And I think when we when we look at that right now, about a third of the business is that custom work that is completely unique um, to anything we've ever done before. And that used to be one out of ten, and now it's one out of three. And and to me that that speaks more to our acceptance as a material that is an option for designers to use, not a unique thing. So like, okay, we're gonna put hide in the dining room and we're gonna do a custom. And they check a box. It's not just what are you using in there. I, I think right. we established a little bit of a, a standard choice option, and, and we still have a ways to go to get it in every project. We're not going to always be in everything, but I think finding that um, process and, and watching it evolve has been really, really interesting to see um, for the material and for what we do in particular. Now, what is the process from concept to design to production and final product? Well, it depends on if it's coming from us or from them. Uh, but it, you know, I think it's like that idea that everything starts with a spark. Mm -hmm. And we're doing a lot of vertical work that is, uh, in many times has a commercial application, whether it's hospitality or retail. And, and a lot of times those designs start with the narrative. And, and it's more, here's what I'm thinking. I think I want to use you in this way. Um, what do you think and how do we improve it? And on the residential side, it's a little more manipulation of shape and color against pattern uh, to kind of hit an end result because usually the, the residential designer is, is kind of working in particular rooms where in commercial and hospitality, it's more of a public experience. And so they're kind of looking at it through different lenses. But in either way, it starts with, you know, we want to use the product in this space and in this particular way. And then it's kind of brought to our team 
which we then render and sample and provide the designers uh, our best take on what they're trying to do and then feed that back to them in multiple options and, um, and, and give them you know, a point of view. If, if, if we hit it right the first time, it's you know, artwork in 24 hours, a sample in two or three days, which is extraordinarily fast. And a lot it's of that is yeah. the fact that we're a domestic production company. I mean, we're in Austin, so uh, the joke for me is I don't get very mad very often, but you know, if I want to throw somebody through a window, it's because <laughs> the client says, yeah, we sent a bunch of stuff in and I never heard from your people. That's where Kyle blows a gasket. <laughs> uh, because you know, you, you can call me, our clients call me all the time. I'm like, we have the next plane. I'm going to go see the project and let's figure it out because we owe it. We owe it to people that are respecting our work and wanting to use us to give them really give them everything we got. Mm-hmm. We really owe it to them. I think. So, besides flooring, you're actually doing uh, wall applications. How did that come about? Uh, it's uh, Christian R.K. Lever's fault. <laughs> I blame it on someone. <laughs> I have a particular person that I will uh, blame uh, in, in credit. Uh, Christian is is an old friend. We've collaborated on a handful of things, uh, including my my successful but maybe uh, uh, less interesting foray into furniture. Uh, but Christian is uh, at the time was a designer, and he's working with David Rockwell at Rockwell Group in New York. And we had developed a collection with David and we were marketing some carpets. And uh, we were at dinner and Christian's like, hey, have you ever thought about putting this on the walls? I mean, at Rockwell, we do a lot of hospitality and, and, uh, and boutique commercial. We could really use this if we could get it off the floor because you know we're not really sure that Nobu and a high rug is a, is, is, is a, is a great match. There's yeah. durability issues, too much foot traffic. And I said, you know, I've been thinking about it. I've been playing with it. And we started sharing some ideas and finding some projects. And, uh, and uh, I said, but I've been a little hesitant to get into it. I got a couple ideas. And he's like, you could call it hide paper. How cool would that be? And I was like, that's amazing. Yeah, let's get into it. We don't <laughs> call it hide paper now. We did for a while. Uh, we just kind of call it the vertical of the wall covering business. But, um, but Christian really incented us and i think you know putting the product vertically opened up a whole new world to us that was non-residential and residential designers use it as well Uh, but it was um, a couple of years ago i think as recently as probably 18 it was Mm -hmm. maybe 15 20 percent of the business but it's almost half now Uh, so half our work are high-end decorative carpets that are predominantly residential and uh, our wall covering business is, is predominantly commercial, but we also do a lot of residential. And uh, it's, um, it's um, I tell you, it's really lit the spark for me. It's a completely different medium to be developing murals and like vertical applications for like lobbies and things like this. It's just, it's just a new creative challenge. It's a lot more dimensional. Instead of an element, it's a feature. And right. uh, although it's really draining and it takes a lot more uh, energy it's really been very, very rewarding to to see our um, our, our wall covering or what we like to call a vertical business, including ceilings, uh, the fifth wall, um, <laughs> uh, turn into something that's that's really a, a, a successful part of the business. So you mentioned a collaboration. Since it's a crucial part in design in a lot of ways, how do you go about working with various uh, design professionals and collaborating on a product or a design? Um, you know, it's it's funny. There is no formula. I mean, there really is no playbook for it. Mm. Um, but I kind of have two rules that I think I follow that at least they work for me. Um, one of them I attribute, and again, we talked about relationships. It's really relationships with everybody. In design, it's, it's material suppliers and employees and designers and their clients. And just, it's a, a deep, it's a, it's a much deeper relationship business that I think people realize. And um, uh, I pull over my shoulder, there's a photograph over, I guess what's my my right shoulder, your left. Right. Uh, but uh, John Lennon, that a friend of mine who's a photographer, Tom Zimbaroff came in. 
And Tom has shot most of my headshots for promotions since the first one in 2001. Uh, to the most recent ones that we did uh, earlier this year. And and I've known Tom forever. He shoots all sorts of stuff for us, but Tom is a a, a world-class portraiture photographer. And and he used to make the joke, or he probably still does. He, we all carry our jokes forever, it seems. <laughs> but, you know, he used to, um, you know, he used to compare portraiture photography of celebrities and influential people to um, to big game hunting. You know, we, we select our prey mm -hmm. and we point at them and we shoot. And, <laughs> and I think analogy. I, I take a little bit of that out, um, where I, I, I'll, I'll meet someone or I'll notice someone and I'll kind of pick up on like, but I, I think I can, I can see that I can do something interesting with them. And then the, the, that's the first stage is kind of going, you know, that, feels like it would be an interesting collaboration because I could see the product that could come out of it and the mm -hmm. story around that. But the second part is, is a lot more uh, important and I didn't really pick up on it in, until maybe halfway through my career in this business. And, and that was that the depth of relationship with the person you're collaborating with has has more to do with the quality of the product than anything. Mm -hmm. it, it, if you're not friends or, or almost family and you're spending time together, and you're really getting dirty and in the weeds on this. The product will never be what it really can be. It's almost like you got to take a vacation together or lock yourself in a room <laughs> and, and really spend some time. Um, I think, um, you know, we did a collection that's got a lot of, a lot of press with uh, Douglas Friedman, partly because Douglas gets a lot of, a lot of press. Yes, he and, does. And He's you know, the show. Also product was really interesting because it was kind of a real challenge. Douglas was going back and forth on a, a bunch of different iterations he was coming up with. And I remember he reached out to me one time and he's like, Kyle, this is really hard. And I'm like, I know. And, and it almost <laughs> like that there was like this forgotten appreciation for the people we work with because he obviously shoots great interior design photography. It, it, and it wasn't a full-fledged like, you know, I took them for granted and I never noticed. But it was a right. little bit of a, of a tip of the hat to kind of go, this is harder than I, than I thought it was because now I'm doing it. And what Douglas did was really interesting. He he took one pattern and because of the way we were designing it, or, or he was designing it, not me, but it, it ended up being one pattern that was interesting as a circle, a square, or a rectangular shape. So it was like a design challenge. It's like the kind of thing you might give kids at SCAD, you know? Hey, right, right. Try to design something great in 24 hours that has this limitation and this one pattern. It's kind of hard. Um, and he and he just he knocked the cover off the ball in his work, and I'm really really proud of it, and I'm, I'm proud of what Atlas is. But he, um, it you know, but it fit the formula. He had shot all these jobs we had done for years, and I had like gotten imagery and and you know he, he just had shot everything, and I'd see my mm -hmm. product in it, and I'd call and go, hey, can I get that image? Oh, sure you can. And I you know promote my business with his photos. And, and then one day it just kind of dawned on me, I'm like, you know, let's do a collection with a photographer. I want to do this with, with, uh, with Douglas as my first photographer. And I, I reached out to him and, you know, a couple of days worth of messages. And I was like, where are you at? He's like, I'm in New York. I said, well, I'm in New York. We're a party. Well, I'm in Seoul. I said, well, I'm in Midtown. I'll, I'll be there in 30 minutes. <laughs> and we kind of, um, my memory was it was a Wednesday and we got kind of blurry. And he was like, well, I'm leaving on Thursday for Marfa. And I'm like, I'm flying back to Austin on Friday. I'll be in Marfa on Friday night. And I just landed, jumped in a car and drove out to Marfa. We kind of spent the weekend together. And you just kind of got to know each other and talk about what this could look like. And, you know, goofed around and, you know, shot right. guns and do whatever <laughs> you do in the middle of nowhere. But, but I think that type of a process, it could be very quick or it could be more a longer process. It's so critical to doing something together because 
you got to get to know each other and read each other and and find something deeper and now i'm learning that why people do this and why they want to see this happen and what that story and narrative is really drives not only the marketability of the collection but it, it really drives the quality of the work more than any factor i, I really I, I could have never seen before could have never seen it before the pieces that i see on the floor are those uh, collaborations uh, they are. We had an event here uh, last night. We bring a bunch of designers in here to the house and host a big dinner. And uh, we had a uh, dinner last night for uh, Brito Charette, which is uh, Jay Brito and David Charette, who I've been working with for over a decade. They're exceptional uh, designers working out of Miami and, and all sorts of other places. But we have a new uh, Brazilian themed collection that is kind of a kind of a primitive and almost bo organic botanical uh, design. I mean, it looks, at, it looks at colorful carnival colors and black and white colors in almost like a microscopic level through, flora, uh, through fauna and viruses and all sorts of crazy stuff. And it's really uh, very interesting and very modern. And so um, I took uh, out what's usually in here as you can imagine, my my house is kind of a revolving showroom, <laughs> and I brought some of their work in, and you can get a little peek around the corner. But it's it's super interesting. We're going to launch it here in a couple of weeks. Fantastic. Where are you represented? Our dudes, does everyone just go directly to your website? How are you approached from designers and other industry professionals? Well, I'm 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 direct, but with special exception is how I'd like to describe it. Um, a few years ago, uh, just before COVID, we, we, we pulled out of the multi-line network. And, and I want to say something about it because I think it's incredibly important. Um, somewhere around 05, 06, uh, I started, I spent a decade being represented all across the country by what I consider the finest showrooms in every market. Um, Holly Hunt represented me. In, in several markets, including in New York. We were represented by David Sutherland in Dallas and in Los Angeles. And independents like the Sosa Hughes in San Francisco, which was where I started my business, uh, to R. Hughes down in Atlanta, mm -hmm. and just a whole bunch of other people uh, represented us in all these key North American metros. I think we had 14 uh, at one time. Wow. And, and they were unbelievable. And it was a moment in time for a, a decade that our brand desperately needed it to bring a new product to market, to reach high-end interior designers who would see what was possible in a, in a couture environment, wrap mm -hmm. their head around the product. Um, those showrooms were invaluable to our success. And it was a uh, it was an amazing run and we, we all learned a lot and got to know a lot of people and, and had an amazing experience. Uh, what we found as the business became more and more custom, it was always made to order, but as it became more custom, kind of the, the, the telephone method, you know, the mm -hmm. joke on telephone, how the message is always lost. Right. <laughs> we, we kept saying over and over again, the showroom salespeople who, who were wonderful for us and we were really close to kind of saying, could you just talk to the client so you can understand what they want? Mm -hmm. And then we'll just invoice them. And, and so the, the sales effort and the design effort and the display effort in their showrooms is the value of that relationship. And as, as it got to be more and more of a, of a custom job, and as our brand was better known, we felt like uh, having a direct business where there was no one between our brand and our clients except us would allow us to do a better job uh what we didn't know is that it would also ironically grow the business pretty dramatically. <laughs> uh so leaving that network really was um, a positive event for the business but the multi-line experience had a it was a moment in time for us that i would never switch out um now what's happened to us is, is we have a a team of salespeople that, that deal with the entire country and designers where we make product and, and, and solutions that we draft and we send strike offs to our clients all over the country from Austin 
Unfortunately, we're centrally located, so our salespeople can reach markets and spend mm-hmm. spend time with clients if they need to. But but an interesting thing um, happened on the way to independence and COVID was our vertical business exploded on the commercial and hospitality uh, side. And so over the last year, we've reinitiated relationships in markets all around the country where we have independent representatives that are servicing hospitality in markets like Los Angeles and Las Vegas and New York and Chicago and Florida um, so that they can get closer to clients in that part of the business. Because it's a, it's a place, although our brand is kind of known, they don't know us as a, a bread and butter option like the residential Correct. space does, or at least I hope. Mm-hmm. And so we uh, have a little bit of a hybrid. Some reps who we love to death and are working with and have gotten to know really, really well in some areas, but most of the residential business uh, is still done direct out of our team in Austin. Is there a project that you can think of that you were involved with that has influenced you? Uh, you know, there's too many, you know, they're like, <laughs> you know, they're like children. You can never really tell anyone which one's your favorite. Um, but I think, um, you know, I have a, a very close relationship with uh, a, a designer, um, Fern Santini, who's here in Austin. And, and in my, you know, and in, and in my experience, she's as good as anybody in the world at this business. And not only is she very creative and has a collaborative nature and a, and a wealth of experience that allows her to do design well, mm-hmm. but but her projects have a soul to them that is is different than a lot of design. There's a there's a subtle message. There's a connection to the client. There's an intimacy. There's a um, there's an artistic almost like a curation of the elements in the in the projects and the spaces she creates. <clears throat> excuse me. That, that I think is is really really special and. To say it, it, that preface is important because I've learned so much from her about how to service relationships and build them and mm-hmm. and do things together. We've done more together than I've done with any other client. And um, we did a project together that started during COVID that uh, you know her business and her website calls Austin and Stereo. It had a different name at the time. Um, and it was shot by Douglas, which again goes to the relationship. Uh, but she had actually done a spec house, uh, had gotten kind of an idea to say, I'm going to do a spec house and I'm going to get a lot of partners in on this, but here's the rules. I get to do whatever I want. And uh, we're going we're gonna to follow that mantra. But if you let me do whatever I want, I think it'll be a success. And ultimately, it was a huge success. Uh, but it's the project I remember the most and is, is probably the most special to me because it was the first time they did something completely different and it was her and I seeing something and it was kind of a home run and we did a ceiling and it's really interesting it's kind of a famous (laughs) photograph now when when I show it to people in presentations and design offices always like half the handles go oh wow I've seen that and it's kind of it has to be the most seen image we've ever created but she used a pattern from a collection we did with Mark Fee out of Winter Park, Florida. He's an exceptional designer. It's called Bloom. And, and you know, she showed me the space and said, here's what I'm thinking. And we both started kind of giggling and like, this thing's That's going cool. on the ceiling. It's going to be amazing. And it ended up kind of being a real home run. And it's, it's just kind of one of those things. It's like the whole thing. The relationship mm-hmm. between Mark, who's a, like a brother to me, who we did a collection together, to, to Douglas ended up shooting it to collaborating with Fern, to even David Escobedo was doing the house and, you know, they and some others were going to be responsible to make sure everything would work and, you know, get on the ceiling the right way. It, it was really, really special. And, and, and I don't know, kind of a moment in time doing it, half of it with mask on and half of it without mask on. <laughs> and, and it's sometimes in those moments where everybody remembers looking at each other and going, can we just take these silly things off for a while? <laughs> and it just, um, it was kind of special in that regard. That, that, it's the one that jo- jumps out at me as, as being a thing that I'll, I'll really never forget. So what drives you, Kyle? What motivates you and inspires you? 
you know, I'm, um, I think I'm a little bit of, uh, I'm a victim of my own um, high energy level, I tend to kind of run pretty hard. And, and also I, I read a book a long time ago uh, when I used to kind of work with people in technology. It was a book called Only the Paranoid Survive. Uh, it was written by uh, Andy Grove, and it kind of talked about how if you're not moving quick and trying to get ahead of the game in technology, somebody's going to catch you. And, and while design doesn't really work that way, uh, there's reproductions and copies. You know, we know how that works. You kind of stay in, in front of it with new design right. work. But I think, you know, having that spirit internally coupled with also another one of my big influences was actually my brother, Mark. Uh, my brother, Mark, used to sell advertising and, uh, and I sold advertising for my brother in the TV business. And, and uh, he used to tell stories about how his boss related to advertising and said, it's like ice. Once it's melted, you can't sell it again. So when Tuesday's paper is <laughs> on the doorstep, you can't put an ad in. And, and I think somewhere in feeling a sense of having a wonderful opportunity that we have to take advantage of is like our, you know, this, this blessing we have and our responsibility to do all we can with it and be as prolific as possible. And a little bit of that paranoia of like, man, let's just, you never know when it'll end. Let's take advantage of the day that I think reading Grove's book and also my brother Mark kind of instilled in me of like, man, you just never know. The, the market can turn on you in a heartbeat and, and something you truly love doing can disappear on you. That's and true. I think that's what drives me and, and you know, entrepreneurship. That's, a, you know, you're, you're sitting there going, well, it's, you know, it's, it's 8 p.m. at night, but if I pick up the phone and call a couple of people and return some messages, it might turn into an opportunity to do something that is fantastic that's not going to happen if you don't. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I'm, I'm part paranoia, part high energy, <laughs> and, and mostly drive the biggest driver is to be prolific. I think this is a real, a real, um, a real special thing that has landed in our lap and we've worked really hard at. And if we don't take advantage of the opportunity to do as much of this as possible, I, whenever I retire, which I, I probably never will, but if I ever look back on it and I'm walking around places and I'm seeing our work in restaurants or I'm entering homes where I find this in a foyer, I'm gonna feel really good about it if I know I, you know, kind of left it on the field, so to speak, to use a, sport, a sports analogy. And that's what really motivates me more than anything else. Being in this industry as long as you have, what has really been unexpected in this process for you? Mm. You know, it, 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 what's been unexpected is, is, is how much it changes and how little it changes. Uh, the, the thing is a business person that really surprised me is the, the inability of this business to transition to, to more of a truly e-commerce business mm -hmm. where people were really designing and buying things online. Everybody thought that, oh, you know, it's all going to be digital buying, you know, and, 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 and of course, a lot of things are bought electronically, but, but Custom and custom creation is incredibly difficult to monetize digitally. Mm -hmm. You know, to design custom carpets and to, to move things around and to say, yes, here's my $15,000 for a huge rug. It's, it's really, it hasn't, but it, it has, but it hasn't surprised me. Like, I, I kind of believe. I kind of drank the Kool-Aid everybody else did, but <laughs> inevitably this has got to turn into that. But the longer you realize it, you know, this is a, this is an artist business. Um, True. Interior decorators. I, I kind of like to, I like to refer to them as, you know, they're kind of like the, the, in art, they're like the lost tribe of Israel. They are the discipline that are artists that I think don't get enough credit, you know, painting and sculpting and the traditional, fine arts categories are their own unique challenges, no doubt about them. But between the logistical issue and financial and psychological of clients and their relationships and the preferences of, of spouses, for example, I, I think creating a, dish, a, 
a, a dimensional space that you can walk into using things that aren't made of your own hand and it'd be overwhelmingly beautiful is art as much as it is design. And I think designers don't get uh, the credit that they truly deserve for being artists. What's your next foray? What else do you want to do? Or uh, I've got a head. couple of new products coming in next year. I've got 12 new collaboration launches and wow. another four seasonal product design or collection designs uh, accompanied by color trend reports and space profiles and a new website. And mm -hmm. we're just are renovating a facility. And, <laughs> and some other things I can't talk about. So yeah, my, <laughs> my, my plate is full. Uh, I, you know, when I was, um, um, bless her heart, uh, I'm divorced, but, but my ex, uh, she had a, a funny moment I'll never forget. She, she was kind of like, well, you're starting a new business. Uh, we're going to get married. We're going to have a baby right away. And uh, we're going to move across country. Is there anything else you'd like to throw on the table <laughs> that's stressful about uh, you know being in a new relationship? I'm like, oh, no, let me think about it. I, I tend to throw the kitchen sink and everything because I think it comes from my passion and my energy. And we really, um, you know, we, we run pretty hard and it, it works well for us. So, uh, but there's a whole lot of new creative work and some interesting product coming from us. I think 2024 and into 25 are going to be real big years for Kyle Hunting and our, and our team and brand. Is there any sector or any other component you want to build upon like you did walls, ceiling, flooring? Well, you know, it, it, it you know, I, I harken back to the comments I made earlier about what we're doing in hospitality. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been able to partner in some markets with some really interesting people. And like I said before, these markets kind of knew who we were. You know, like if I go in and speak to like 20 people and I ask, hey, does anybody know who we are? Or am I just some guy coming in out of nowhere? <laughs> you know, it might be like two or three hands like, oh, I, I know you guys. And, and there's, there's almost always somebody who's like, Oh yeah, I follow Douglas Friedman. I know all about who y'all are because he's kind of the elephant in the room on social media. It seems in the business uh, right now. But but what I what I'd like to say to answer your question is is we really um, I don't want to say it's a second lease on life because it sounds like I am bored or tired of our residential uh, business. But the the things we're doing in in, in hospitality have really because the challenge is so different, but we're doing what we do has really um, kind of given me a new fire, you know, kind of a second life mm -hmm. where, you know, I, I think I traveled last year, you know, probably once a month, you know, made 12 or 14 trips. I go to Italy a lot because my tanneries are there and, and, and I go to New York and, you know, the usual places mm -hmm. you expect designers in North America to be. Um, but I was, I was in Austin, I think 19 days this summer, and I have been constantly on the road and it has been a joy. I'm meeting new people and I'm seeing new things, but this, this opportunity in a public space for people who didn't purchase our product to see it and right. it's somebody else's, but they get to enjoy it is really unique. And it's kind of got, you know, kind of got the creative juices uh, turning and we're seeing things that are super exciting and we're getting brought in on projects where they're saying, we like what you do. We think the material's interesting. Here's the narrative of the renovation of this hotel, or here's the idea of the restaurant. Um, we were thinking this, this, or this, do you have any ideas to add to that? Uh, or are those things possible with what you do? And I think mm -hmm. it, it, to be a, a creative partner, on some of these projects to come in with our take and and have you know maybe i don't know maybe we're about nine out of ten where where people are like oh Not those bad. are great ideas yeah we like that you know one out of ten like we got it figured out maybe that's not where we want to go uh, maybe that's too far it, it's been really really uh, rejuvenating to me personally and i think it's also exciting for our brand the, the lead times are much longer which give you a little bit more time to think about it but they're much, uh, they're really interesting. And, and I'm having a, uh, I'm really thrilled watching 
people think about using our work where the people that enjoy it are not the primary purchasers of the product. And I think that's the, the difference. So if there's one thing you could tell someone that's never heard of your product, what would you tell them? It depends on where they're coming from because, you know, <laughs> explaining what we do is not the convenient elevator pitch. You know, it's a little tricky. Right. And I think, you know, when we run into people, we're like, look, we're in the design business and we make wall coverings and carpets, but we're a little unique. We make them out of leather. And in particular, we use hide. And we're like, what's hide? I'm like, you know, like cowhide. We use hide, <laughs> a, a leather that is not smooth, that still has you right. know, the hair on it. And immediately people start thinking, oh, you know, like those speckled things, those brittle things, they kind of go into a Western place. And, uh, and, and we have to say, no, it's not exactly that. Uh, it is, um, it's a tricky thing. I, you know, if you, if you're, uh, you know, if you're, if you're married to me, it, it's kind of a, the hard thing is, you know, I can't just say he's a lawyer or he's an accountant or, you know, he's a graphic designer. It's, you know, he, he makes hide carpets. What? Well, what's a hide carpet is kind of the, <laughs> the, the, the answer that's so tricky. And so I think, you know, for us, we never really knew how to, how to say it. Uh, but when we, but when we do meet people, I, I like to say, look, we're in the design business and we do a kind of a unique product and it, it kind of looks like this and it has these things. And, but what I, but I always try to parlay is, but we have a really passionate group of people that do what we do. And, and, and the thing I'm most proud of is we're kind of nuts about it, but we're, 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 you know, we're, a, a little bit evangelical, but we're in the sense of as long as you understand it and get it and can appreciate it, that's the battle. We don't have to sell it. We want the order. We want people to buy our product. That's you know one of the reasons we're in business. But if we establish it as a standard and design that people will use, and it happens to be that our brand is is dominant in that space, and we get our our fair share of the business, I'm just as happy as as if. Uh, even if we did that, if we were a smaller business than we are doing fewer projects, I'd be okay with it. Because for me, I'm, I'm just really proud of the fact that, that that our team has kind of pulled it off. And I, and I think that says a lot about bringing something new into the market. It's really hard. And I'm very, very proud of that. Is there anything you want to promote, share, tell us about? Uh, I'm, I'm about as... Um, uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey <laughs> meets game show host as you ever get. So I think I've taken a lot of your airwaves, make sure everybody understands how passionate uh, we are about this. But, you know, but in, uh, in, in, in our time where we are right now, if people were hearing us and said, okay, I think I've heard enough, uh, I, I would say that, you know, to relate to people that, that, what's most important to us is the relationships we build through this business. And that if our work in some way or another turns people on or inspires them, they think they want to use it. We're as happy to go through the process and design something with someone and sample it and show them what's possible, win or lose, uh, as we are to just get the order arriving in the mailbox. And somebody says, here's a drawing and here's a check, go make that. Right. Uh, it, it, for us, it's about getting to know the people we get to work with and the avenues and the roads and the experiences that leads us down. I mean, that's the real gold. So um, I don't have a product that I want to tease or a collection that I want to hint towards. But I, I, if I had every designer in the world in the elevator with me for 30 seconds, I'd say we want to have a relationship with you. And I think if you give us a shot at that, win, lose, or draw, I think you would really appreciate getting uh, to know our small business in Austin, Texas, uh, a little bit better than we do now. Well, sir, that is fantastic. And any last closing comments you want to share? No, I just want to do what everybody else does, but I mean, and I hope you can tell I'm a genuine guy. And I, I really appreciate uh, the time and energy it takes, uh, having been in the media business, to do what you do. And uh, the effort and scheduling and pre-interviewing and all the research. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really grateful for all that you're doing, both on the content side and to get your message out and to provide an asset to the design community by, uh, you know, bringing, you know, 
I guess people like me and others uh, to your your platform, and I uh, I salute you for it and the hard work, and I thank you for letting me come in and tell my story. Absolutely, absolutely, it's been an extreme pleasure, and thank you for your time today, and look forward to chatting with you again some other time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Kyle.